Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Today we're going to be talking about CMOS electrical properties, which includes the voltages that we use and the compatibility with some of the other things. We're going to be talking about power dissipation, which CMOS is known for, and it's what allows us to make stuff very highly integrated. Can't dissipate a lot of power in a, in a package full of stuff, right? And then we're also going to be talking a little bit about layout. I actually want to show you, yes, that's a wafer. I actually want to show you uh, some of how CMOS is actually made. I had the experience of working with chip designers back at Commodore, and uh, uh, let me show you some of what they taught me. So stick around. In a moment, I'm going to talk about what CMOS means, where those letters come from. But first, let's review the family real quick. Uh, CMOS was best known for being low power. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were talking about the TTL in the comments last time about how it's old. Well, CMOS is old, too. The process, uh, some of the parts, um, but they've gotten better. So, the, you know, we were known for low power, but slow, and like the old CD4000 series, which are still some good parts out there. I don't, I don't care what you say, there's some great parts. All right, but, you know, you have to look at the usage and what you use them for. I knew a guy that dumped a CD4000 part down an oil well to a couple hundred degrees, derated it for speed. It went very slow, but it worked. It, it, it was linear extrapolation to temperature versus speed. Can't do that with a bipolar part for the most part. So nowadays, they're low power and fast, CMOS we're talking about. Um, and it, they're low power static, meaning when they're not moving, they're very low power, and that's due to high impedance. There's no current going in the inputs of them, and the output is whatever they're driving to. Uh, as the speeds increase, CMOS power in increases, and I'm going to show you why, power dissipation. So, um, and nowadays, CMOS parts have lots of output power. In the early days, they, they were little twiddly things, and nowadays they, they, can, they can produce an output current high and an output current low that just rivals some of the bipolar, especially they can do a better job of getting those equal. If it's, tw if it's 64 milliamps up, it's 64 milliamps down. So uh, uh, they're good parts. Let me show you, though, when we talk about old versus new, I'm going uh, to show you a, a graph here that uh, one of the vendors made that uh, talks about the advancement of CMOS. Here's an interesting diagram I pulled from a TI uh, bulletin about one of their uh, families, and it does show the rise and decline, the, the, the bell curve here of, of uh, the old parts, the TTLs, the shot keys, and some things in the middle, the FAST and the HCs, and then as we come around the curve and we're getting into the, the new stuff, and you do see the red is uh, CMOS. You do see CMOS is kind of kind of mostly driving the way into the low voltages, low powers is what drives a lot of these, our small devices these days. Uh, but there is also some bi CMOS, which means it's a mix of, of bipolar technology and uh, CMOS technology. So kind of an interesting graph here. Of course, in this, they're trying to show you, they're trying to sell you on AHC. Uh, as one of the families. Here's another chart. This one though, it's an interesting chart. It shows the voltage versus the speed of the CMOS families and you really can get a feel for the progression for, you know starting with the old high-speed CMOS which was you know kind of starting to replace uh, CD4000s which aren't shown on this chart and as they progress through the family we see we also progress through the voltages down into the lower voltages but that we also progress getting faster and faster. Now what's not shown on here is the old CD4000 family, which was one of the first, and uh, it could go to 15 volts. So it actually had uses. I helped uh, uh, Alka with one of his old synthesizers the other day, and everything was running off 10 and 15 volts. Lots of headroom for noise, right? So here's something you can't do, you know, is run at 15 volts. We don't see that a lot these days. All right, CMOS means complementary metal oxide semiconductor. And the complementary part means we're going to use both P and N channel devices, which simply means we can pull up and down equally. But MOS, metal oxide semiconductor, is actually short for MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So let's start with those. I want to show you the various kinds, and then we're going to build forward into how C CMOS evolved and why it's useful today. Okay, MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. Uh, before I jump into that, you may have heard of a junction FET. Well, in that case, the gate, which acts like the base in a transistor, if you want to think of it that way, the controlling uh, uh, um, pin, um, actually touches the rest of the device, hence the word junction FET. has a lot of uses. They're kind of rugged, and uh, but the current here joins with the other currents. It's not as high impedance, higher, higher impedance than some, but not a true MOSFET. A MOSFET, metal oxide, the oxide it means insulator, it means silicon oxide in this case, 
other oxides are good insulator too but in this case silicon oxide and that's this air gap here and if that looks like a capacitor I'll tell you that's a capacitor with that said this is a voltage device at this point this puts a voltage uh, a field onto the rest of the device and it will either turn off the device in the case of depletion mode it depletes the signal flow depletes it or it enhances the signal flow and turns the device on and again with only a gate voltage applied will this turn on so this is like a normally closed switch and this is like a normally open switch if you want to think of it that way I do so there's two polarities to these also so we've got a total of four depletion enhancement in channel P channel the in channel MOSFET and I've showed enhancement here because I think they're by far more common um, this is really good at pulling down and we see the a, a way to recognize as when you see the two legs down that's the direction that it's good at and so in channel devices or even in MOS we're good at pulling down and P channel devices are good at pulling up CMOS complementary MOS is where we use both of these so that we're equally good at pulling down and up here I've hooked those two devices together the in channel pulling down the P channel pulling up and ran them to a signal and this is a simple inverter if uh, when this signal goes high it will turn on this device pulling it low when this signal goes low the input it will turn on this device so another way we can draw it that's actually uh, helpful to remember is we can draw it with an actual bubble here on the PMOS device so when it's low it's active and when this high this is active one way to remember if if it's an active low or if a part has a bubble is if we were to put a bubble on this one this arrow would be in the direction of the bubble and pop it so uh, we can put a bubble here no problem no bubble belongs here this is an active high device. okay real quick I want to just show how to make a NAND gate a not AND gate and it's how you hook the devices together so quite simply when this is high and this is high both of these will be high they're in series something you can do with the CMOS stuff and that's when both of these will be turned on and pulled to low any other combination has at least one of these um, low turns on the pull up and any other combination that doesn't have both high doesn't so there's no conflict when you look at it so now that we know that this is a voltage device that CMOS doesn't allow much current a little leakage but not much current that means that this is high impedance there's no impedance to load down the source voltage such as if your finger touched a resistor to ground there'd be no appreciable voltage on your finger but if you were to touch CMOS's high input impedance uh, with a finger and it's got static on it you just get tremendous voltage can be applied to this device and it'll punch holes right in this very thin oxide as one of the failure mechanisms or another one it'll splatter when it does that so you end up with uh, stuff all over the inside of the chip and it's just a matter of time before it then fails due to usually a heat mechanism um, so what we end up having to do is put diodes on here to protect the input so that the input in theory can't go above this voltage or below this voltage now of course it takes a while for that diode to turn on and a lot of times these are actually FETs these days that perform the diode function um, we used to get all the time something called SCR latch up uh, meant silicon controlled rectifier latch up now it's in the days of SCRs and thigh wristers, which is how we made our cool light organs blink to the music and stuff and quite simply um, it's not simple there is a a P and N a P and an N junction formed by the way all of these things come together that wouldn't happen if you were doing either just NMOS or PMOS alone and it's because we have to flip the polarity some some things and we'll talk about what an N well is here in a bit um, you end up with something that looks like this I've I've used to draw it like this when I was younger um, and and the way I visualized an SCR turning on was this tunnels to where it's only an N and a P junction and, and the currents wiping through that well in the reality it's a pair of transistors back to back and the way these combine you get a resistive effect which turns on it's a cascade effect transistor turns on which turns on the air transistor and pretty soon everybody's turned on and we used to have to remove power for 10 seconds or so to let this undo uh, you know let it unlatch um, and you think you'd blown the heck out of whatever you're working on sometimes you had but sometimes you could turn it off let it sit and it would turn back on uh, otherwise it'd just be dead right all right, right let's talk about TTL voltages versus CMOS voltages let's let's have that conversation now I, I want to go fast enough that this isn't too boring but I don't want to go so fast that I just leave too many facts missing so but bear with me here so real quick the old TTL if you remember we had a lot of headroom here we get to 2.4 volts and we throw the rest of this away 
Well, in 5-volt CMOS, that's not the case. You split it in half, and that's your threshold. The upper uh, two-thirds around that area is where, you know, it said, hey, I'll produce at least this much. I need at least this much on my input. Same on the lower end. So you'll see it's, it's kind of a nice linear spread. And that actually carries out through the lower voltages except for the TI logic guide that did this, and I recolored it so it looked good to us. Um, they blew it. See, there's a zero in here when there shouldn't be. So uh, looking at this then, you can see that if you drive CMOS into TTL, provided you have enough current capability, and these days T CMOS has a lot of current capability, the output high is well above what we need, and the output low is really, really close to what we need, right? So uh, there generally wasn't a problem. If in doubt, check for yourself. However, going from TTL to CMOS, you'll see he says, oh, I'm only going to guarantee you this high, and he says, well, I need at least this high. So you can use a pull-up resistor. I may show it later in the video, just show a little picture of a pull-up resistor on a gate. Um, but uh, if you do the math and make sure that the pull-up resistor doesn't break any rules, overheat anything, provides enough current in the meantime, um, you can translate from TTL to CMOS. Told you I'd show you a TTL gate with a pull-up on it. This actually works a lot of the time. I'm just not saying all the time because you should do the math and you may find an instance where it doesn't. But normally if you have like a high-speed CMOS, advanced high-speed CMOS, advanced CMOS, etc., um, you put a pull-up on here and it'll make your V input low or V input high. Or you could use a T version when you see the T on the end. Sometimes there's T's in the middle. Uh, like uh, a high-speed CMOS TTL compatible input. Uh, same thing here and here. Uh, you don't need the pull-up and the uh, input thresholds have been jiggered to actually be compatible a lot of these get used. So this is typically how you do a TTL to CMOS where the voltages are otherwise the same. I'm going to stop there. I've got so much more to get through, but I'm going to stop and make this a two-parter. So I hope you uh, join me for part two of Gates to FPGAs. We're working on CMOS electrical properties. Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Come on back. <laughs>